Hey folks, so today we are going to be looking at Typhoon Haiyan. So if you just write that in the middle of your sheets. Now Typhoon Haiyan is one of the strongest category 5 hurricanes ever recorded. And I'm not going to try and draw a hurricane, but we know that they go in this sort of anti-clockwise formation. Okay. And it happened in the Philippines in 2013. Okay. Now, don't get fooled by the word typhoon. It's just a word that they use in the Philippines for a tropical storm or a hurricane. It is your hurricane case study. Okay, so this is one we want to remember. Now, there's four different things that we are going to have a look at. Okay, so we're going to draw our four arrows. Uh, the first thing we're going to have a look at are the primary impacts of the hurricane. And then a quick look at the secondary. And then the, the immediate responses or the short term responses. And finally, the long-term responses. Okay, try and keep this really simple, because remember, in a nine marker, you could be asked to compare and contrast primary and secondary impacts, all the short-term and long-term responses. And you won't need every single thing that we're writing down today, but we will need you know, probably between four and six different facts. So if we start with the primary impacts, this huge uh, hurricane, Typhoon Haiyan, it affected the whole of the Philippines, but it had a particularly devastating effect on Tacloban, which is the uh, one of the cities there. In total, it killed 6,300 people. And it had a storm surge, so if I just draw a wave, I don't mean a single wave, it's not, it's not just a single wave, but it just shows that the height was five metres above normal. And that storm surge, that raising of the sea due to the low pressure, it actually destroyed 90% of the town of Tacloban. And I mean complete devastation, much like you would expect to see on a sort of a tsunami, really. So 90% of Tacloban was destroyed. In addition to that, 600,000 people were displaced. Now, what we mean by that is that they were moved from their place of home, place where they go to school or work, and they had to be relocated to somewhere else in the Philippines. And that was 600,000 people made homeless, jobless, that kind of thing. In total, just draw a house for you, 40,000 homes were destroyed. Many of them, just draw another house, due to flooding. And the reason for that is that there were huge amounts of rainfall. So there's normal rainfall and then there's an additional 400 millimetres of rain, okay, which led to that flooding. Finally, if I just draw some power lines, okay, these are those really tall structures that you see sometimes out in the countryside. They should all be connected. Well, power lines were destroyed and many of them due to the flooding and the strong winds, which we'll come to in a minute, but the, the power lines went down, which meant that people were actually without electricity. And the wind speed, the top recorded wind speed was 170 miles per hour. I'll put an exclamation mark there because I think that's quite a hard number to actually appreciate. 
I think in the UK, in your lifetime, you might have possibly experienced 70 mile an hour winds, uh, perhaps in Storm Kira that happened earlier this year. But add another 100 miles an hour to that and then you'll start to perhaps appreciate how strong uh, that wind speed actually is. It was, because it was 170 miles an hour, it was a category five hurricane. And with that, it was one of the strongest ever category fives. Okay, so moving on to the secondary impacts. So starting, I'll just add power lines down. Starting to think about what went wrong in the maybe the months, the years, and other things that followed. Well, in total, by the end of this disaster, 14 million people across the Philippines had been affected in one way or another. A really staggering number of people. And out of those people, I just draw another person. This one's holding uh, kind of a briefcase. Uh, six million jobs were lost, which obviously affects on a wide affects the individual, but on a wide uh, sort of scale, that affects the country's ability to recover from this disaster, as those jobs and those. You know, those taxpayers aren't paying tax and so on. You know, the infrastructure and the services can't easily be um, repaired. Uh, furthermore, i just draw a road. Um, many of the country's roads had landslides. So that's where rocks and mud and soil and so on falls down hillsides, often because they're very wet and there's been lots of rainfall and, and wind and so on, and actually blocks roads. So that's sort of flooding, causing landslides. That's a secondary impact because obviously the rainfall and the flooding is the primary impact. Um, additionally, there were quite a lot of other situations issues is sort of our secondary impacts but power so with those power lines coming down we had a lack of electricity and also a lack of clean water because we know don't we whenever there's flooding um it affects you know it affects houses it affects it, the infrastructure and our clean water sanitation systems often get polluted by dirty flood water because of the flooding as well, there was an inability to, you know, harvest food, grow crops, work, you know, shops and so on were destroyed. So there was a complete lack of food as well in the area. And that meant without food, clean water and power, disease, diseases such as cholera, waterborne diseases, increased. Okay, making people very sick. And whilst you might think this is a good thing, I'm sure they didn't, uh, many schools were forced to close, either because they were flooded or because the buildings themselves were destroyed. So there was a lack of education for the country's young people. And now we need to move on and have a look at some of the short-term and long-term responses. So just underline those. Okay, so in the short term, they just needed rapid aid. The Philippines isn't the wealthiest country and therefore they couldn't recover easily on their own. So if we just get some sort of fast arrows bringing in aid. Now, as we know, aid could be food, could be water, could be medical supplies, could just be money, in fact. Um, this form of aid came as NGOs which we know are non-governmental organisations. Things like the British Red Cross or Oxfam. And they came in and they set up 
what we call field hospitals. It's kind of like tents really, with lots of um, beds in them for people who needed the help. And they brought in doctors and nurses and they were able to go in and actually help some of those uh, very many people who'd been affected by the floods. So field hospitals. The sort of mobile shelters that can be moved around and they also set up, I'll try and put this in, quite large sort of evacuation centres, which you could come and you could stay in if you had nowhere else to go. Big evacuation centres. And lots of people chose to use them. They were well attended. Um, in addition to that, there were search and rescue centres. Or, actually, sorry, I must just add, there were 12, sorry, 1,200, so 1,200 of these evacuation centres. And then, yeah, finally, apologies, awful drawing of a helicopter, but there were helicopters brought in, not from the United Nations, but actually from the USA. The USA is quite heavily involved in parts of the Philippines. They came in and they offered helicopters for search and rescue. So those are some really, really good short-term responses. But in the longer term, there was much more work that needed to be done. The first thing was that they actually created some safe zones. These are areas away from the coast. And that's quite difficult in the Philippines because it's made up of, sort of an archipelago of islands. But they made safe zones where they built accommodation for people who had lost theirs. And these homes, they were in safe areas, high land, away from the risk of flooding and built with you know, relatively good modern materials. So in those safe zones, people were actually able to flee. And the other thing that they did is in the long term is they repaired the roads. Remember these roads had been severely affected by landslides caused by the flooding and that these roads are vital transport links for food, for medical kit, for getting people to jobs and, and for resources. So we needed to repair key roads, particularly around Tacloban, but also in other parts of the Philippines. Now to do that, they needed money, and they needed money from the United Nations, who has a sort of disaster appeal fund. Oh, just put that then. United Nations, and they also needed for people that remember there were a lot of people that were affected by this. They also needed medical help. And that came also from the UN. And then as soon as they could, I'll put this one in down here, they got people fishing again. Now the Philippines has a huge industry in fishing. Now they don't all fish with a hook and line like this, but it's just to remind you that so key industries like fishing got rebooted so that people could earn a living, could make money again, could look after their family. And the other thing is the rice paddies. So if I just draw sort of a field with lots of kind of rice and things. So much of that money, that aid from the United Nations was put back into things like rice farming, giving people the ability to earn their way out of this disaster. So there you have it. Typhoon Haiyan, many different primary impacts, many different secondary impacts, the short-term responses and the long-term responses. And just remember, you could be expected to talk about the differences between the two, comparing and contrasting them, and you would need between four and six facts.